Welcome to Fantastic Forum. I'm your host, Devon Sanders, and we got a lot of really good stuff coming up for you today. But first, I'd like to introduce my guests to my right. I got Derek Scarzella, I've got Christopher Ma, and I've got Drew Bittner. And today's topic, we're going to be talking about Batman, one of the most enduring characters out there nowadays. So I'm going to throw it to the panel now. So what do you think makes Batman such an incredible character? Like, why through like all the iterations of like Adam West and his wackiness and and uh, the uh, Michael Keaton Batman and the Tim Burton stuff and even through like the Joel Schumacher debacle that was like his two movies mm-hmm. and then on to like this whole like uh, I mean the Chris Nolan stuff I mean people just seem to love Batman mm-hmm. why he's just simple I mean he we were discussing earlier the fact that. He has his origins in these noir pulp roots. He comes from that era, dark creature, avenger of the night. Comes into your house in the middle of the night, but to do justice, not to right. do anything bad. <laughs> yeah. um, and he beats bad guys with nothing more than his wits, uh, a really spooky cape. And um, you know, and he now with the superheroic, and you know, superheroics in DC, he can hold his own with with Superman and Wonder Woman and the others without anything more than his wits and. That's something I think everybody feels at some basic level is, you know, yeah, I'm such a badass that I can do that without help. And <laughs> okay, even though yeah. he's a rich, rich guy. So, right. You know. mm-hmm. Yeah, and also that the core of it is a little bit of revenge, mm-hmm. which is relatable. I mean, there's his history is rooted in tragedy. Mm-hmm. And from there, you know, you just he's just been running ever since. And anybody can relate to, you know, wanting to get back after someone you know, does something that horrible to your family. But he's brought it out. So it's not a petty thing where it's just revenge against one person. You know, he's turned it into a crusade. Right. And there's more to it than just, I want revenge. I want to make things right. I mm-hmm. want justice. And, you know, any regular person can relate to that. Okay. I think another thing about Batman is, first of all, he's been around for so long. You know, Superman is really the only character that's been around longer than, than Batman that, that we would know, that you know, the public would know. And the great thing about him is that because his, his story is so basic and so relatable, you can tell any kind of story with Batman. That's you know? very true. Like, There's, like true. anything. Yeah, I mean, know. like, uh, during, like, the Justice League International years, Batman was often the straight man in, like, a comedy book. Yeah. So, like, yeah. I mean, like, we used to, like, kind of joke at the comic shop when we would all be there together, like, saying Batman is, like, the Swiss utility knife <laughs> or, of, like, comic books. He yeah. can be whatever you need him to be. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, there's, the and, there's, recent, I'm sorry, and, there's, and there's no character that really serves that same kind of role mm-hmm. in, in Marvel or DC. Yeah, because you know. it's interesting that you mentioned Superman. Of course, you've got to mention Superman when you're right. talking about Batman. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's like Batman can do what Superman can do in a way. But you couldn't picture Superman doing anything that Batman could do detective-wise or anything. Because, right. I mean, he's Superman. He, he can walk into a crime scene and see DNA or whatever. Batman has to work a little bit at it. But he can jerry-rig something where he's pretty powerful in a, mm-hmm. any given yeah. situation. And he has to think his way out of it. But the versatility of the character really is amazing. Because even with all of the various Elseworld iterations, all of the variant parallel types of Batman, yeah. you can take the, the origin story and transport it to almost any time time or place and it works mm-hmm. you know yeah. I mean, you can do it viking batman mm-hmm. you can do cowboy batman you can do japanese samurai batman yeah. and it doesn't and they all work just with the with the same sense of justice so yeah. that's the thing that's always amazed me it's such a versatile character uh mm-hmm. that, that you know it's amazing frankly yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean the superman story works in the same context but but superman and batman do very different things um batman is a detective his job is figuring out things it's mm-hmm. finding evildoers it's punishing the guilty Superman's is largely just beating stuff up. Right, or smashing really. it. <laughs> yeah, or, or saving a falling plane or an ocean liner that's sinking or things that really require a lot of brute strength are really Superman's yeah. thing, whereas Batman's a thinking man's character. He's, or he's a mm-hmm. thinking character. And that kind of like leads into like the next thing that I'd like to bring up, like the man's rogues gallery, the villains that he oh, fights. Yeah, of course. Yeah, make of that course. character. Yep. So, I mean, from the Joker to Catwoman to Two-Face to Poison Ivy to the Riddler, you just have these incredibly complex characters who could probably float their own books if they really needed them to, but they're Batman villains. Well, it's like the perfect example, the Joker. If you read something like The Killing Joke, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's about the Joker, and Batman just plays this relatively minor role in that, 
but it still works and Batman's such a huge presence but the Joker still comes off as this incredibly complex character where other villains you see I mean they have their gimmick but that's it but with the Joker it's like there's so many different levels you can play off of like the juxtapositions in that book just it's amazing how much oh, yeah. you, Alan Moore did with the character but you know everybody else can jump in there and just have a sick joke and manage to make everybody laugh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've only thought that a couple of the Batman villains were really ever I don't know really powerful and lasting characters. I mean the Joker being one of them but Catwoman and a couple of the others. I think the others are just more gimmicky types that we're just fond mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. like the Penguin and and the Riddler you know they're just kind of yeah they're nice opposites. Mm -hmm. They're they're contrary but they're not really what I would say lasting characters in and of their own I mean they may even be archetypes but I just don't think that they're like really powerful characters the way Superman or Batman are <clears throat> but um, I think a lot of those characters have uh, a certain they play off the darkness Batman's darkness very well and you know I think there's a reason why some of those work so well in that context I think that part of the genius of, of creating the Batman rogues gallery in the first place was really uh, consciously or unconsciously mimicking what Chester Gould was doing in Dick Tracy. Having these mm -hmm. freaks and these monsters fighting the very clean, very, you know, establishment hero. Um, and honestly, I mean, a hero is measured by his villains. And if you don't have somebody that's super dangerous like the Joker or, you know, Bane or Two-Face or, or the people that have been really very dangerous to Batman, not only physically but thematically and psychologically and everything else you know if, unless they present a threat on more than one level then it's just easy to write them off as like oh well that's just a guy who right. you know yeah and, and again sorry. going back to super I'm sorry going back to superman like superman's villains could probably wipe out planets but you know batman villains are going to come after you in a very nasty way yeah you know and that's yeah. pretty scary because i mean because all of batman's villains are, are basically street level criminals right. that you know knocking over a bank you might be at a bank you know right. um, and if you just happen to be in Metropolis well if Doomsday comes to town well then you've got a, a bad day but <laughs> you know the thing is that if the Joker comes to town he will he will shoot you and yeah. he'll show up in your bedroom he will while kill you yeah. yes he'll, That's kill, the thing. he'll kill you yeah <laughs> Doomsday will take out a city block but the Joker will shoot you Right. So then that's a difference. Yeah. So. With like a bunch of like faceless, like sort of like Gothamites just dying left and right. Yeah. That's just what happens. Yeah. It's like it's mm -hmm. the killing. It's totally a killing zone. Yeah. yeah. And for some reason, I think that, you know, Batman speaks to that. Like that there's somebody out there looking out for you. Mm -hmm. Like even through like the bad stuff. Not, not the bright and shiny stuff that Superman fights, but, you know, just the sort of base borderline stuff that actually happens in real life. Yeah. But even, not even that Batman's going to come up at the right time, even if something has happened, he's going to set it right. Okay. Even if it does take time, even if it does have to do his detective work and go through the yeah. files and all that slow stuff that regular detectives have to do. <laughs> but he's going to make it right. Exactly. You just, just have to catch the bullet at the right time. All right, just hold that thought for a second, and we're going to like cut the Yuli, who's actually going to be at Fiberglass Freaks, where they make Batmobiles. We'll be right back. The most well-known superhero vehicle of all time is Batman's Batmobile. Faster than a racing car and better equipped than a tank, Numerous versions of Batmobiles have served the Dark Knight detective for over 70 years. Perhaps the most iconic of all these cars debuted on ABC TV January 12, 1966. Although a mid-season replacement show, Batman, starring Adam West and Burt Ward, was an immediate hit. The show was a pop culture phenomena. Batmania swept the nation. The show ran for three years in primetime and achieved cult status in syndication. Well, now you can actually own your very own Batmobile, courtesy of Mark Raycop and his fiberglass freaks, who have the official license from DC Comics to reproduce this iconic automobile. Fantastic Forum visited Mark in his Logansport, Indiana headquarters. Let's take a look. 
This is how it all begins, with a fiberglass car body that we mount to a 1970s Lincoln Town Car. The fiberglass car body comes out of a 22-piece mold, and we assemble the entire body here at the shop. And the car body comes out of the mold as a one-piece body, so there's nothing grafted together. And then we have a separate hood, uh, doors, and trunk lid, and that, that provides a lot more strength to a car body to do that. And it's a little bit rough, as you can see right now, and then we do a lot of body working to work on the seams of the car to start to smooth it out. Uh, we cut open the areas for the hood, the trunk, and, and then make it a, a very, very smooth transition from this to the next step, which is over here. This is a car that is in the middle of a paint job. Very shortly, we'll be finishing up the striping on the, the headlight uh, buckets and then matching those onto the, the hood. So it's coming along very nicely and it won't be long and we'll be wet sanding this car and buffing it to an absolutely spectacular shine and then going into the final assembly and giving it to the customer. This particular customer is in Iowa. It takes about six hours to do all the masking for the striping and uh, we're doing some minor touch-ups here to the striping. I wasn't pleased with the striping so that always means more work, right? But the striping takes about six hours to mask the entire car. And I usually do that starting at about 11 o'clock at night, so that way when the painters come back in the next morning, it's all prepped and ready to go. It takes about six months to build each car from beginning to end. And that includes the tearing down of the Lincoln Town Car all the way through the final, final assembly of the vehicle. The paint job itself, uh, that particular portion of it, takes about four or five days. We, uh, we usually start off by painting the stripes, and then we'll paint the black, and then we'll clear coat the whole car. I was two years old in 1967 when I saw my very first Batman episode. I fell in love with the music, I fell in love with the action, the color, everything about the show, but especially the Batmobile. This particular car just caught my imagination, and I said, I believe this, at two years old, I said, someday I'm going to build a Batmobile. Fifteen years later, my friends and I were tearing down a 1974 Monte Carlo and turning it into the Batmobile. That was my Bat-1 car, and that's what started it all. Hi, I'm Matt White. I'm from Wabash, Indiana. I'm our head mechanic. I build most of the engines, transmissions, do all the mechanical work as far as brakes, suspension, things of that nature. And I also build all the wiring harness to completely wire the car from front to back. I do fabrication and for the most part do a little bit of everything. Every single person that works on a Batmobile is very, very important to this team because without, you know, it's like a chain, as they always say, that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Well, that's the case here with building the Batmobiles as well. So we need every single person to do their work and to pull, pull their own weight to make it all happen. And we have an absolutely outstanding team and it's been great to work with them and uh, we make these absolutely magnificent cars and without that team, without every single person, we wouldn't be able to do it. Here's one of our latest gadgets. This is a prototype. This is a working, blinking, beeping, Bluetooth bat phone. And it actually does work. It'll receive the signal. Yes, Commissioner. We have a remote back computer switch over here on compartment number five. <laughs> did you know? Did you know that Batman had the first wireless computer? He really did. Batman had the first wireless computer with the remote back computer switch. You remember that Batman reaches into the rear package tray and presses a button, <laughs> and then the trunk uh, the, yeah. the trunk raised automatically. Guess how they did that. Here's a lot of fun. On Batman, see, they didn't have electric actuators like we have today. Instead, they uh, welded a couple of rods onto the hinges and they had wires. They drilled holes through the floor pan of the car and two stage hands are off to the side of the Batmobile, pulling it to raise that <laughs> trunk lid and make it look like that it was a powered trunk lid. We can do that for real now with our electric actuators. There are only two features that pretty much don't work just like on the original car. No, the bat turn lever does not turn the car around 180 degrees. And no, the T-arm accelerator lever that's in between on the center console, in between the passenger and the driver, it does not make the car go 300 miles an hour. Outside of that, all the rest of the features and gadgets do work. Lower. Lower. It 
it's an absolute blast to have the Batmobile going through the drive through at McDonald's because everybody comes to the side windows there and they're just plastering their faces against the glass to see the car. Okay, we are here at the Baltimore Comic Convention talking to comic artist David Finch. Thank you very much for being with us, sir. Well, thanks for having me. You've uh, recently signed an exclusive contract with DC, right? That's right, yeah. Uh, how are you enjoying being at DC so far after having spent so many years at Marvel? It's been great. You know, I, I had a great time at Marvel, and, uh, you know, it was a tough decision to go, and uh, I, I really wasn't ready to leave, but I was really ready to do Batman, and, uh, you know, since I've been at DC, I, it, it really doesn't take long, you know, to... Um, become close with everybody and, and develop relationships and you know I feel very comfortable there they're, they're great people and it's it's been really good for me you had done quite a number of collaborations with uh, Brian Michael Bendis uh, you think there's anybody over at DC that you're going to get similarly connected with as far as writing uh, actually you know there there is I'm working with um, Paul Jenkins now uh, he, uh, he just came over to DC from Marvel himself and uh, I was having a lot of scheduling problems with my book. I'm doing uh, Batman the Dark Knight, and uh, I just could not keep up with the writing. It's, it's a challenge. I, you know, I think I didn't really appreciate just how difficult writing is. And uh, I started talking to Paul uh, a little while ago about the story and some of the trouble that I was having. And, and you know, we just clicked so well. Um, and he was coming to DC, and I managed to talk him into doing the book. So yeah, he's my writer now. I could not be happier. He's doing such a great job, and you know he's uh, he's an A-level talent. You know, so I feel very lucky to have gotten him. Now, obviously, you're going to be at DC for a while. What other characters would you like to work on during your time there? Oh gosh, you know, I I, I wanted to do Batman for so long that it's it's hard for me to really even look past it. I think. Um, I don't know if I'm really the right artist for Superman, but I would love to do it. It's kind of in the back of my mind. I, I drew him a couple of times. I, I just did a JLA cover. Superman was on it, and every time I draw him, it just, you know, he's the original superhero, and uh, I think I would love to do that. So, you know, ask me right now, I would say Superman. I would love to do that. During your time at Marvel, you did so much stuff with the Ultimate Universe. Uh, what sort of reaction have you gotten from people over that work? Yeah, I've got, I've got, I guess, the whole range, you know. Um, I did Ultimate X-Men, I also did Ultimatum, and uh, you know, I've had people come up from both books and say, you know, I love, the, I love this part of it, I love this part, I've had people come up and say, why did you do this, you know, <laughs> you know how, how could you let this happen, so, you know, I think uh, those are comics people are very passionate about. Well, you know, and the art, too, had a lot to do with that, but, you know, you've been a part of so many watershed events, you know, over at Marvel, because the other thing that comes to mind is the Avengers, you know, both Avengers Disassembled and then the new Avengers, which, you know, also has been some stuff that that I really, really liked, particularly the first 10 issues of the New Avengers. Uh, you know, that was, it was a book that when I agreed to do it, I didn't actually know what it was. I, I got a call from uh, Bendis and they were in an editorial meeting and I guess I came up with the idea and, and he called and said, you know what, I have a book that I want you to do. It's got, uh, it's got Spider-Man, Wolverine and Captain America in it. And, and I said, wow. And he said, I, I said, well, uh, you know, can I think what? He said, no, 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 I gotta know right now. <laughs> Tell me right now. And I, I said, okay, sure. <laughs> so uh, that's actually how I left Ultimate X-Men. I, I was planning on staying on. I was really enjoying it. So it was a surprise. And I didn't find out that I was doing the Avengers. I think probably for a good month afterwards. I had no idea what it was. It was a, it was a secret. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, he just he just broke all the rules with that book and, and really changed everything and turned it on its head. And I think it was, I mean, in retrospect, you know, like it was necessary. I mean, I think Avengers is still now Marvel's uh, cornerstone, you know, and I, I can't say that it ever was in that way before. So you really can't fault what he did. Are you going to get to make a cameo in this new Avengers movie that's coming out? I highly doubt it, but uh, <laughs> if they call, I will be there. <laughs> and we're back. Welcome back to Fantastic Four. Uh, next thing we're going to talk about, we're still talking about Batman, but we're going to veer off just a little bit, talk about Batman and the people who love him. 
mainly like the Robins, <laughs> the Dick Graysons, the multiple Robins, the multiple Batgirls, the Huntresses, Alfred. Batman and Alfred. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Alfred. 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 One exactly. Yeah. Um, Batman positioned pretty much as a loner, like initially, but then along comes Robin, along comes more things. And now you can't even have like a Justice League team without a Batman now. Does Batman still need like partners? Does he work best alone? Thoughts? Uh, I guess for me, I think that, yeah, because, because we're used to it. All right. We've, we've seen it so much and it's been done so well so many times, even in different permutations. I think that Batman works very, very well when there's a Robin to bounce off because you have usually the grim Batman and the much lighter, much more exuberant Robin. That's been the model mm -hmm. before. Um, it's a little bit different now because the Batman Robin team is Dick Grayson mm -hmm. as Batman and Damian Wayne as Robin. And Damian Wayne is actually the more cynical, uh, dark character right. in some ways. So there's a different dynamic, but it's the same kind of dynamic. Um, and I think that I think that yeah, I think it works well. I mean, I don't think that Robin is really a gateway for for kids to see somebody that they could be. That I could be. I can't be Batman, but I could be Robin. Right. You know, yeah. maybe maybe the way the kids. 30, 40 years ago might have. But, um, but yeah, I think that, that Batman works better with a Robin in the mix. Okay. I, I've always agreed with, I guess, the opinion of Frank Miller that Batman by himself is almost a little too pure. You know, I mean, if you, you, you have Batman by himself, it's like just, you know, eating chocolate purely without sugar or anything. It's just too much. <laughs> right. Uh, um, and so Robin or whomever you play Batman against dilutes that and and adds a little bit to it that is more than just like pure wasabi or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes Batman a little more interesting because you can see just how badass he is. So having the kid partner is always a, a good contrast, I think, for Batman anyway, because um, you know here is someone who is younger and less dark and less cynical and wears a bright red costume. And, you know, you contrast that to someone who's dark and brooding and very serious with a black or dark gray costume all the time. And so you have that nice um, contrast. So yeah. I think there's this interplay that works really well when you dilute um, Batman with, you know, other forces. Yeah. Well, I, I think it depends on the circumstances. Like, if you look at Batman Year One, I think that's a... You could argue that... Um, Commissioner Gordon's a big part of that story as well, but that's one of the few stories where Batman is the central character. Right. He's developing, and it's just Batman right there. Mm -hmm. So I think it depends on the situation, but what I like about Batman and Robin most, or when he's paired with someone, is like you do have this pure Batman character who's laser focused and you know all dark and brooding, and then you have a kid next to him just burst the bubble, you know, <laughs> makes him say, "What are you doing, stupid? Why, right? Why'd you do that? <laughs> you know." <laughs> Those mm -hmm. are bullets they're shooting, duck or something. You know? <laughs> right. And um, it is a ridiculous situation, but because it is ridiculous, it sort of works itself out. And uh, I don't. I I was like seeing him like he's got his laser mission, but he's got to change everything on the fly, and you know, do something with Robin or make it work. So mm -hmm. plus, from a logistical point of view, you really do need <laughs> multiple people just. To, to cover the city. I mean, I've tried to get across town on a bus or in a car. You know, I don't see how Batman can get across Gotham in like 10 minutes, even with a helicopter, without some kind of help. So I just logistically, I don't see how he does it. But uh, One other thing I'd like to touch on is like through the years, we've seen many different like versions of Batman. Like we've mentioned Adam West before. We've mentioned Val Kilmer. We've mentioned like uh, Christian Bale. Mm -hmm. Ultimate Batman. Who goes first? <laughs> I'd like to chime in. Okay. I, I, I like the, the Christopher Nolan Batman the most right now. I think it took some of the better elements from Tim Burton's Batman, and film-wise, and is sort of just taking it to a more serious level. Not in terms of, like, attitude per se, but just uh, the basis for it, the technology and the, the, uh, the creative thinking. Like, that's, that's what I think is the best part about this new Batman. You really see him coming up with solutions. And right. you're a part of that process. It's not just, oh, a, a boulder. I'll get my boulder-destroying device from my utility <laughs> belt. There's, there's real science behind there's it. There's something sense. to that, though. No, that, that, that's right. true. That's true. Like the yeah. old-school Adam West Batman with the ridiculous mm -hmm. solutions for ridiculous problems. Right. But, but to me, Nolan has just found a great recipe. And okay. um, they're running with it, and it's, it's working so far. All right. Chris? Kevin Conroy. 
The man yes. who can not only be Batman in the Justice League, an old Batman in the future, but sing nightclub songs as Batman. I mean, geez, that as far as I'm concerned, he's always going to be the voice. That man's of voice is Batman. I don't think he'd ever. He doesn't look like Batman, obviously. No. but but to me, that's always going to be the essence of Batman. I I have to second Chris on that. I think Kevin Conroy is the definitive uh, media. Yeah, Batman. Yeah, if you're if you're looking for um, audiovisual, you know, if you want to go back through the serials, through '60s, you know, Batman, Adam West, um, the Super Friends, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all these right. different all these different versions and incarnations. I think uh, Kevin Conroy's version with you know in the in the Bruce Tim style and all those guys that that really put together the DC animated universe. Um, that's the definitive Batman in so many ways. Mm. I think he just encapsulates everything that's awesome about the character. Exactly. Um, in terms of the um, the comic book version, the ultimate comic book version of Batman, I think you're probably looking at Denny O'Neill's okay. and Neil Adams' version, um, Frank Miller. Okay. Um, and on that note, Chris, if you had to recommend like a comic <laughs> book to actually give to someone that says Batman, what would you recommend? Uh, well, I'm going to second Drew's recommendation of the Neil Adams Batman from the 70s, um, written by uh, Denny O'Neill, uh, drawn by Neil Adams. I mean, a lot of the quintessential Batman stories are taken from that. Um, you know, the the uh, Man Bat stories and the Reaper and, and all mm -hmm. the other things. And then these aren't like the mainstream Batmans that I would that everybody will like, but I really have a soft spot for the Gene Colan Batman. That is 80s. good stuff. That's actually going to be collected very soon. Yeah. Got to kick it to Derek. Yeah. I want to go last. You go. Okay, you uh, go Dark Knight Returns. Fred okay. Moore. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to say the killing joke, I guess. Okay. Just because if someone hasn't read Batman before, I'd like to give them something like, this is going to screw your mind up. <laughs> I, I hope you enjoy it. If you don't, tough luck. No. But this is pretty good stuff, and if you don't get it, you don't get it. That is a very good one. And me personally, it's Gotham Central. And with that, we're going to say goodbye. Thanks for watching.